Chapter 5, West Africa. So, Section 1 is going to talk about Nigeria, which is the land that's pretty diverse. And uh, the three main objectives were to learn to identify Nigeria's three main ethnic groups, to understand the major events in Nigeria's history, and to find out about the conflicts faced on its path to democracy. So the ethnic groups of Nigeria. Uh, the country has many different ethnic groups, bunches and bunches. The three main ones are the Hosa Fulani, which are in the northwest, primarily in north and northwest. Uh, the Yoruba, which are in the southwest, which are the second biggest. And the Igbo, which are in the southeast, which is the third biggest. But as I said, there are many more groups. And you can see this based on the linguistic map of, of uh, Nigeria. So you can see the Hosa Fulani up here, Yoruba, and down here, the Igbo or Igbo. Um, so that's just the idea. So now the Hosa Fulani, the Fulani conquered the Hosa and combined with them. Most of them live in the countryside and herd cattle and farm crops like peanuts and sorghum. Uh, they built cities in the north uh, of Nigeria like Kano. The Yoruba, they're the most urban of the groups. They have built cities since the 1100s and the cities were ruled by kings. Lagos is the biggest city in Nigeria and most of the people there are Yoruba. Many people are herders, craftsmen, and farmers in the countryside, um, if they live in the countryside. And they grow mainly cash crops. Now uh, the Igbo, they're traditionally rural and live in small villages uh, that are, are ruled by uh, democratic councils. Uh, many live in cities today, but the first president of Nigeria was an Igbo. Now in terms of religion, this is a map of religions of the world, but in terms of religions for Nigeria, about 50% of the population is Muslim and practice, faith, practice the faith of Islam. About 40% are Christian, and about 10% are traditional, which means that they are neither of those, and uh, generally probably an animistic faith uh, that basically is one that uh, looks at sort of nature, deities, and things like that. So. Now, Nigeria's history, the area of Nigeria was ruled by many different people, uh, different African groups. Portugal, though, they were the first real contact and they started slave trade with, uh, in their 1400s. And the Netherlands started to trade there too. Uh, Great Britain took over in 1914. And in 1960, Nigeria became independent. The capital was moved from Lagos to Abuja to try to unite the people more and to put it in the center of the country. Now, in terms of the uh, path to democracy, it's been pretty bumpy. Lots of difficulty unifying the three groups due to religious language and other differences. In 1966, there was a military coup, uh, so the military overthrew the government. In 1967, there was a civilian uh, civil war where the Igbo tried to separate. Uh, by 1970, the end of the war, the country was still united, but thousands had died. Now, in terms of religion, the hosts of Fulani are mainly Muslim. Uh, the Igbo are, are mainly Christian, and the Yoruba are both. Uh, other practice, others practice different religions. And up here you see here, this is a map that shows states that are under Sharia law, which are all these green ones up here, which is a version of Islamic law, and uh, inspired by the Quran, and by the deeds and practices of Muhammad also. So you can get an idea that very firmly entrenched up there, and there's uh, a uh, terrorist group called Boko Haram that tries to spread uh, tries to spread Islam and tries to spread the Sharia law even though um, even to other areas and to all of Nigeria so now in Nigeria approximately 95 percent of the income comes from oil exports tremendous amount of oil there uh, they use foreign workers and companies for oil, so most of Nigeria's citizens do not benefit, and there's disputes over who should get the wealth. So if you remember that video we watched where there were people who were smuggling uh, oil out and uh, attacking pipelines and such, and this ends up being a big deal, uh, since a lot of the oil wealth is from the north as well. And uh, actually, I saw this National Geographic article which referred to Nigeria's oil as the curse of oil because it's allowed the Nigerian government to stay in power because they can afford to buy weapons and to support themselves as opposed to having to work with other groups. Now, in terms of democracy for Nigeria, there's been a struggle really since independence. Military leaders gave up power in 1999 and there were actual elections, but it's still a very corrupt society. Now we're going to move on to Ghana. Now when we're talking about Ghana, Ghana is uh, the first sub-Saharan sub African country to become an independent, so it's interesting as a case study for that. 
and we're going to uh, learn about the years of British colonial rule in the area that is now called Ghana. We're going to find out about the beliefs that helped move Ghana towards independence and discover how Ghana changed after achieving independence. Now in the colonial years, uh, the people in the area wanted freedom from colonial control for hundreds of years. The Akan people, they were one of the original groups, they formed the Asante Kingdom. They tried to stop Europeans from taking over their territory, but they failed. This was all, an, all of an attempt to get around the Trans-Saharan gold trade and to take over this area that was uh, rich in gold fields. So in 1874, Great Britain colonized the area and called it the Gold Coast. They ruled the colony by getting help from uh, help controlling it through local chiefs, and this is actually one of the military installations. They had a big old fort uh, in uh, in Ghana. So the effects of British control mainly they wanted to control the economy, wanted cash crops that they couldn't grow in England, especially cacao, which is uh, used to uh, make co uh, chocolate. Excuse me, not coffee, but chocolate. This led to fewer food crops, and uh, they had to start importing food that they used to grow. Now, profit was mainly in Great Britain because that's where cacao was uh, changed into cocoa and then into chocolate, so Ghana did not get much money. It also started to buy more manufactured goods from Britain, and here there are cacao pods here, and so you can see it's a, it's a very laborious process. Mixing old and new, the, the English, they did go ahead and build some schools, they tried to introduce more Christianity, uh, but the people of Ghana tried to combine some of these ideas with the old traditions and the new. In terms of moving towards independence, many colonies wanted independence. However, the mother countries argued that colonies themselves were not ready to rule. Africans argued that they'd ruled themselves for uh, a long time before the Europeans came along. If you look here, this map here shows a, a map of all the countries. Uh, like the blue is where France was in charge, and, and you can see this brownish area is where uh, Great Britain was in charge. You get a real idea of when the countries became independent based on the dates, dates there. And so if you look over here at Ghana, 1957, that was fairly early on. Traditional government. The largest ethnic group in Ghana are the Akan, and they believe that a leader could be replaced if they ruled poorly. So you can see the Akan states down here. Now, uh, Nkrumah is the uh, name of the first uh, leader of, of the new country of Ghana. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah, he'd been educated in England and the U.S. He had traveled through his country uh, trying to get people towards, to work towards independence. And he was doing this in a uh, nonviolent way. And eventually there was independence. And in 1957, Great Britain agreed to grant sovereignty or political control of their own country. Nkrumah became the first leader. They chose Ghana in recognition of the historical kingdom that was from around the area. Now, the first uh, it was the first West African country to get independence, and uh, relatively soon after that, Nigeria became independent too in 1960. Uh, it was second in all of Africa after South Africa, which is kind of sort of since it was the uh, white people that took over after that. So, now Nkrumah he actually was overthrown in a military coup d'état. Uh, which led to an overthrow of him, removed him from power. And he went from being a hero to being disliked. He essentially made deals with foreign nations and borrowed lots of money to do things like build a big dam on the Volta River and, uh, by, uh, by Lake Volta. And, uh, and when, then when the price of cacao beans fell, the economy crashed and Kurma was blamed by uh, a lot of people. But once people realized later that he was not a cause of their problems, uh, they started to think better of him. In 1972, when he died, he was hailed as a hero in this, uh, who had led his country to independence. This is actually a, an image of his, uh, of his mausoleum. Pretty fancy, huh? Now, Ghana's government and the economy today, in 1981, military officer Jerry Rawlings took over the country. He tried to emphasize cooperation. And he stepped down, and now there is a democratically elected government. Now we're moving on to Mali. And uh, we're going to focus on desertification and the problems of the desert spreading. Uh, we're going to, if you look up here, the idea of uh, discover how Mali's environment environment affects its economy, find out how desert can spread across the land, and learn about the importance of preserving Mali's environment. Now, Mali's environment, Timbuktu in the state is in is not the capital anymore, it's the Bamako, but um, Timbuktu is, was an important capital at one point of sort of this trading area around uh, Mali and this area here, around the Niger River, so uh, it's in the Sahal, and one third of the land is desert, and the, the desert is expanding relatively rapidly. 
resources of the Sahal. The Sahal goes all the way from Mauritania to Ethiopia. In those areas, that's where a lot of the people at certain times of the year, they herd animals and plant uh, during the wet season. Niger River is an important water so source that allows them to be able to do that. And if you see here, this the, the Sahal, this whole region here, and relatively arid, and then up here really is just the plain old desert. And down here, the semi-arid area, that's uh, the savanna. And same with this part here. Now, Timbuktu was an important stopping point for camel caravans going from North Africa to the savanna. Uh, there's a l and now there's very little trade there because uh, people no longer have to go up the uh, Niger River. And the desert, unfortunately, is spreading. Most people in Mali make their living farming, trading, or herding. However, all these jobs are threatened by the desertification or the change of fertile land into land that is too dry or damaged to support life. Some of this is done from overgrazing. When animals graze in an area they eat and can eat the roots of the plant, this makes the soil uh, more easy to blow around because the roots are not holding it in place and leads to more erosion. In terms of drought, there's also been much less rain over the last 30 years. This has led to fewer plants also. These are some of the elephants that are from uh, actually in sort of the Sahal region and uh, some of them have died due to drought conditions. Preserving the environment. Uh, the UN is trying to work out a plan to stop desertification, but the main problem is that people are going to have to change the way they live. Like telling people to stop herding animals is kind of a hard sell when that's what they've been doing for hundreds of years. Uh, way of life in danger. One group that in particular is having problems is the Tuareg. There are nomads who herd goats and sheep and camels. Some of them have been forced to settle down on farms or in cities due to water shortages. And uh, the country is trying to educate people better on how to use the land, and the UN is helping.